My name is David. For years, I believed I had a picture-perfect life. I worked as a software engineer for a mid-sized tech company in Chicago, a city that always felt alive with its bustling streets and vibrant culture. My wife, Emily, was an art teacher at a local high school. We had been married for 15 years and had two wonderful kids, Nathan, who was 12, and Lily, who was 10. Our lives were comfortably nestled in a quaint suburb just outside the city, where the streets were lined with oak trees, and every neighbor knew each other by name. Our house was a charming three-bedroom home with a white picket fence. Classic, almost cliché, but it was our dream. The backyard was where Nathan played catch, and Lily hosted her imaginary tea parties. Emily had a small studio set up in the garage where she painted during her free time, and I had a modest home office, complete with the usual tech gadgets and shelves filled with science fiction novels. Life was good, or so it seemed. We were the kind of family that took annual road trips, had regular game nights, and shared inside jokes. Emily and I made sure to keep our relationship strong, despite the demands of work and parenting. We had date nights every other Friday, and we never went to bed angry, or at least, that's what I thought. Our circle of friends included neighbors and colleagues, but my best friend was Jake. Jake and I had known each other since college. We were roommates at Northwestern University, and our bond had only grown stronger over the years. Jake was a financial advisor, charismatic and full of life. He was the godfather to Nathan and Lily, and Emily often joked that if something ever happened to me, she'd have Jake step in as their father. Jake was a constant presence in our lives. He joined us for barbecues, birthdays, and even some of our family vacations. His wife, Sarah, had passed away five years ago, leaving him with a void that he tried to fill by immersing himself in work and spending time with us. Emily and Jake got along exceptionally well, sometimes even better than I did with my own wife. I used to think that was a blessing, having my best friend and my wife get along so well. How naive I was. Looking back, it's hard to pinpoint the exact moment when things started to unravel. Maybe it was the subtle changes in Emily's behavior, or the way Jake's visits became more frequent and lingered longer. But in a life filled with routines and familiarity, it's easy to miss the signs until they slap you in the face. It was around the beginning of summer when I first noticed the changes in Emily. They were subtle at first, like the way she started dressing a bit nicer on days she knew Jake was coming over. Emily had always been naturally beautiful, with her auburn hair and green eyes, but she seemed to be putting in extra effort. She began wearing dresses more often, applying makeup even when she was just staying home. One Saturday, while Emily was out running errands, I was cleaning up around the house. As I passed by her studio in the garage, I noticed her phone buzzing on the workbench. It was a message from Jake, something about meeting up for coffee to discuss important stuff. It struck me as odd. Emily and Jake had always been close, but they never met up without me unless it was for something specific, like planning a surprise for me or one of the kids. The more I thought about it, the more instances began to piece together in my mind. There were the late-night phone calls that Emily excused herself to take in another room, the text messages that made her smile in a way I hadn't seen in a while. When I asked her about the calls, she would shrug it off, saying it was school-related or a chat with one of her art student's parents. One evening, we were having dinner when Emily got another text. She glanced at her phone and her face lit up before she quickly set it aside. Nathan, ever the observant one, asked, Who was that, Mom? Oh, just Jake, she replied nonchalantly. He wanted to know if we're free for a barbecue next weekend. Something didn't sit right with me. I knew Jake well, and he would usually just call or shoot me a text for such casual plans. That night, after Emily had gone to bed, I checked her phone. I felt guilty like I was invading her privacy, but my gut was telling me something was off. The messages between Emily and Jake were innocent enough on the surface, but there was a familiarity and warmth that felt different, too personal, too intimate. My suspicions grew stronger when I found myself excluded from their conversations. They had inside jokes I didn't understand, referenced events I wasn't aware of. I started to notice the way Emily's mood lifted when Jake was around, how she laughed more freely how she seemed to glow in his presence. One night, as Emily was taking a shower, I heard her phone buzz again. It was another message from Jake. Last night was amazing. Can't wait to see you again.
My heart pounded in my chest, a mix of anger and dread. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, but it was hard not to with a message like that. I decided to confront Jake about it the next day. We were supposed to meet up for a quick drink after work, something we did occasionally to catch up. Sitting across from him at the bar, I felt a knot of anxiety tighten in my stomach. Jake, is there something going on between you and Emily that I should know about? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. He looked genuinely surprised. What do you mean, Dave? I saw your message to her, about last night being amazing. What's that about? Jake's expression shifted from surprise to concern. Oh, that. Dave, it's nothing like what you're thinking. We were just talking about an art exhibit she took me to. I didn't mean anything by it. I wanted to believe him. Jake was my best friend. But something in his eyes didn't match his words. It was as if he was trying to convince himself as much as he was trying to convince me. Over the next few weeks, I tried to push my doubts aside, but they kept creeping back, gnawing at me. Emily's behavior continued to be erratic. She started staying out later, claiming she was working on a project with a colleague. Our sex life, once passionate and fulfilling, had dwindled to almost nothing. She was always too tired, too busy, too distracted. One afternoon, while the kids were at school and Emily was supposedly at a meeting, I decided to take a look through her things. It wasn't something I was proud of, but I needed to know. In her studio, tucked away in a drawer, I found a small box. Inside were letters and notes, all from Jake. They spoke of love, passion, and longing. My heart sank as I realized the truth was staring me right in the face. My best friend and my wife were having an affair. The box of letters left me stunned. I sat on the floor of Emily's studio. The evidence of her betrayal spread out in front of me like some grotesque puzzle. Each letter, each note was another piece of the sordid affair, another dagger to my heart. The words were raw and intimate, describing moments they shared, plans they made. I felt a mix of rage and sorrow, a churning storm inside me that threatened to consume everything. In one letter, dated only a few weeks ago, Jake wrote, Emily, you are the light in my life. Every moment with you is a treasure. I can't wait until we can be together without any secrets. Another letter talked about a weekend trip they had taken while I was away on a business trip. They'd gone to a small cabin by a lake, a place where Emily and I had often talked about visiting. I knew I couldn't confront Emily without more concrete evidence. The letters were damning, but I needed something undeniable, something that would leave no room for her lies or denials. That night, I barely slept, my mind racing with thoughts of betrayal and revenge. By morning, I had a plan. I decided to take a couple of days off work, telling Emily I needed some time to de-stress. She barely reacted, engrossed in her own world. While she was at school, I installed a small camera in the living room, another in her studio, and one in our bedroom. I felt dirty doing it, like I was stooping to her level. But I needed the truth, no matter how ugly it was. The next day I told Emily I was going to visit my parents for the weekend. She seemed relieved a reaction that only fueled my suspicions. Are you sure you don't mind being alone with the kids? I asked. Of course not, she replied with a forced smile. We'll have a great time. As soon as I was out the door, I drove to a friend's house across town. Mark was a detective with the local police force and we'd known each other since high school. I explained the situation to him, showing him the letters and notes. Mark was sympathetic, but he warned me to be careful. Dave, you need to stay calm. Gathering evidence is fine, but don't do anything rash, he advised. Let me know if you need any help. With Mark's words echoing in my mind, I parked my car a few blocks away from my house and walked back, using the back entrance to sneak into the basement. I set up my laptop, connecting it to the cameras I'd installed, and waited. The house was quiet, too quiet. Emily was probably picking up the kids from school. A few hours later, I saw it. Emily and Jake walked into the living room, laughing and holding hands. My blood boiled as I watched them kiss, oblivious to the hidden camera capturing every moment. They sat on the couch, and Emily leaned her head on Jake's shoulder, looking more relaxed than I had seen her in months. They talked in hushed tones, their conversation filled with whispered promises and plans for the future. Emily mentioned wanting to leave me, but Jake seemed hesitant. It's not that simple, Em. We need to be careful, he said. 
the scene was both surreal and devastating. Seeing the woman I loved in the arms of my best friend was a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. I felt a sick satisfaction knowing I had the proof I needed, but it did little to ease the pain. That night after Jake left, I confronted Emily. I couldn't wait any longer. My heart pounded as I walked into the living room, the letters in one hand and my phone in the other, ready to show her the footage. Emily, we need to talk, I said, my voice trembling with barely contained rage. She looked up, startled. David, what's wrong? Don't play dumb. I know everything, I spat, throwing the letters on the coffee table. I've seen the messages, the letters. I saw you with Jake. Emily's face went pale, her eyes wide with shock. David, it's not what you think, she stammered. Not what I think, I shouted. I have video evidence, Emily. I've seen it all. How could you do this to me, to our family? She started to cry, but her tears only fueled my anger. I'm sorry, David. I never meant for it to go this far. Sorry? You're sorry? That's all you have to say? I couldn't believe her audacity. You've been lying to me, to our kids. You've destroyed everything. Emily tried to reach for me, but I stepped back disgusted. Don't touch me. Just tell me why, Emily. Why did you do it? She wiped her tears, her expression shifting from guilt to defiance. Because you were never there, David. You were always working, always too busy for me. Jake was there when you weren't. He made me feel alive again. Her words cut deep, but I knew they were just excuses. That's bullshit, Emily. I've always been there for you. This is on you, not me. The argument escalated, voices rising until Nathan and Lily appeared at the top of the stairs, frightened and confused. Seeing their innocent faces broke me. I couldn't continue this fight in front of them. Go to your rooms, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Mom and I are just talking. They hesitated, but Emily nodded, and they slowly retreated. I turned back to Emily, my voice cold and determined. I want you out of this house. Tonight. She looked at me, stunned. David, please. Let's talk about this. There's nothing to talk about. Pack your things and go. We'll figure out the rest later. Emily tried to argue, but I was done listening. I walked out of the room, leaving her to deal with the consequences of her actions. As I heard her crying and packing her things, I felt a strange mix of relief and sorrow. The woman I once loved was now a stranger, and our life together was over. The next morning the house was eerily quiet. Emily had left late last night, taking just a few bags with her. I didn't know where she went, and frankly, I didn't care. All I knew was that I needed to protect my kids from the fallout of our crumbling marriage. I decided to take the day off work and spend it with Nathan and Lily, hoping to give them some sense of normalcy amidst the chaos. At breakfast, the kids were unusually subdued. Nathan picked at his cereal, while Lily stared at her juice, her eyes brimming with unasked questions. I knew I needed to address the situation, but I wasn't sure how much to tell them. Dad, where's Mom? Nathan finally asked, breaking the silence. I took a deep breath. Mom needed some time away. We're having some problems right now, but it's not your fault. We both love you very much, and we're going to figure this out. Lily looked up, her eyes wide with worry. Are you and Mom getting a divorce? The question hit me like a punch to the gut. I don't know, sweetie. We're trying to work things out, but it's complicated. Just know that whatever happens, we're still a family. The rest of the day was spent trying to distract them with games and activities. We went to the park, played board games, and watched movies. But the shadow of uncertainty hung over us, and I knew it would take more than a day of fun to ease their fears. That evening, after putting the kids to bed, I poured myself a drink and sat in the living room, trying to process everything that had happened. The betrayal, the confrontation, it all felt like a bad dream. My phone buzzed, pulling me from my thoughts. It was Jake. Seeing his name flash on the screen ignited a fury within me. What do you want? I answered, my voice cold. David, we need to talk, Jake said, his tone desperate. There's nothing to talk about. You and Emily destroyed everything. I know, and I'm sorry, but please, just hear me out. Against my better judgment, I agreed to meet him. We decided on a neutral location, a small park not far from my house. As I approached, I saw Jake sitting on a bench, looking more disheveled than I'd ever seen him. He stood up when he saw me but I didn't offer a handshake. David, I'm so sorry. I never wanted to hurt you, he began, his voice shaky. Save it, Jake. Just tell me why. Why did you do it? He looked down, unable to meet my gaze. I don't have a good answer. 
Emily and I, we got close when you were busy with work. One thing led to another. And before we knew it, we were in too deep. In too deep? I spat. You betrayed me, Jake. You were supposed to be my best friend. And Emily? She was my wife. How could you do this? He finally looked up, his eyes filled with regret. I know I messed up. I've lost my best friend. And for what? A few stolen moments? It wasn't worth it, David. It wasn't worth losing you. His words rang hollow. The damage was done, and no amount of apologies could fix it. You're right. It wasn't worth it. And now I have to pick up the pieces of my broken family while you get to move on with your life. Jake nodded, tears in his eyes. I'll do whatever it takes to make this right. If you want me to stay away from you and your family, I will. Just know that I'm truly sorry. I didn't respond. I turned and walked away, leaving Jake to wallow in his guilt. As I headed home, a wave of emotions crashed over me. Anger, sadness, betrayal. It was a storm I didn't know how to weather. When I got home, I found Emily waiting on the front porch. Her eyes were red from crying and she looked as lost as I felt. David, can we talk? She asked, her voice trembling. What is there to talk about, Emily? You had an affair with my best friend. There's nothing left to say. Please, David, just let me explain. I know I don't deserve it, but I need you to understand. I sighed, feeling the weight of the day pressing down on me. Fine, come inside. We sat in the living room, the silence between us heavy and oppressive. Emily took a deep breath and began to speak. I'm sorry, David. I never meant for any of this to happen. It started innocently enough. Jake was there when you weren't, and I needed someone to talk to. But it got out of hand. I know I've hurt you, and I'll regret that for the rest of my life. You had a choice, Emily. You could have come to me, told me how you were feeling. Instead, you turned to Jake. I know. And I was wrong. I was selfish and stupid, and now I've lost everything. But David, I still love you. I want to make this right. I want to fix our marriage. I looked at her, my heart torn. Part of me wanted to believe her, to try and salvage what we had. But the pain of her betrayal was still too fresh, too raw. I don't know if we can fix this, Emily. You've broken my trust, and I don't know if I can ever get that back. Please, David. Let's try counseling. Let's do whatever it takes. I'll do anything to make this right. I shook my head, tears filling my eyes. I need time, Emily. I need time to process all of this. Right now, I don't know what the future holds. She nodded, her own tears falling freely. I understand. I'll give you the time you need. Just know that I'm not giving up on us. As Emily left, I felt a mix of relief and sorrow. The road ahead was uncertain, filled with more questions than answers. But one thing was clear. I needed to find a way to heal, for myself and for my kids. The days turned into weeks, and the wound of betrayal festered inside me. Emily had moved in with her sister, and I had taken on the role of a single father, focusing all my energy on Nathan and Lily. The anger and bitterness gnawed at me, eating away at my sanity. I couldn't shake the images of Emily and Jake together, their whispered secrets and stolen moments. It was all too much. I needed to do something, to find some way to channel my rage. It was a late night, and I was sitting in my office, staring at the letters Emily had written to Jake. Each one was a knife to the heart, but they also gave me an idea. I remembered the conversations I'd had with Mark, my detective friend. Maybe I could use his skills to get back at Jake, to make him pay for what he'd done to my family. The next day, I called Mark and explained my plan. I wanted to dig into Jake's life find anything that could ruin him professionally and personally. Mark was hesitant at first, warning me that revenge could backfire, but he understood my need for closure. Okay, Dave, I'll help you. But remember, this could get messy, he cautioned. I don't care. I need this, Mark. I need to see him suffer. Mark agreed to look into Jake's background. Over the next few days, he uncovered a lot. Jake had been involved in some shady financial deals. Transactions that were illegal and could land him in serious trouble. It was the leverage I needed. I spent hours compiling all the evidence Mark had gathered. Financial records, emails, documents, everything pointing to Jake's illegal activities. I knew exactly where to send it. I packaged everything up and mailed it anonymously to Jake's boss and the authorities. It was a bold move, but I didn't care about the consequences anymore. 
I wanted Jake to feel the same pain and betrayal he had inflicted on me. It didn't take long for the fallout to begin. Within a week, Jake was under investigation. His accounts were frozen, and he was suspended from his job. The news spread quickly, and soon everyone knew about his shady dealings. His reputation was destroyed, and his career was in ruins. But that wasn't enough for me. I wanted him to feel the emotional pain, too. I contacted his late wife's family, people who had loved Sarah deeply and trusted Jake to honor her memory. I sent them the letters and messages between Jake and Emily, exposing his affair. The betrayal cut them deeply, and they turned their backs on him, disowning him completely. Jake tried to reach out to me several times, leaving desperate voicemails and texts, begging me to stop, but I ignored them all. I reveled in his misery feeling a twisted sense of satisfaction as his life unraveled. Then came the final blow. I knew Jake had a significant amount of money hidden away, a nest egg he had kept secret from everyone, including the authorities. With Mark's help, I hacked into Jake's accounts and transferred every last penny to various charities, ensuring he had nothing left. It was risky and illegal, but I didn't care. I wanted him to be as broken as I felt. When the dust settled, Jake was left with nothing. His career was over, his finances were ruined, and he had lost everyone he cared about. It was a hollow victory, but it was a victory nonetheless. I stood in the wreckage of my actions, feeling a mix of relief and emptiness. I had achieved my revenge, but it didn't bring the peace I had hoped for. The pain of Emily's betrayal still lingered, and the damage to our family was still very real. In the end, I realized that revenge had consumed me, and while it had given me a temporary sense of justice, it couldn't heal the wounds or undo the past. I had to find another way to move forward, to rebuild my life and protect my children from the fallout of this bitter chapter. As I looked at the photo of my family on my desk, I knew that the road to healing was still long and uncertain, but I was ready to take the first step, for myself and for Nathan and Lily. They deserved a father who could rise above the pain and find a way to create a new beginning for all of us. The days following my revenge on Jake were a blur. While there was a grim satisfaction in watching his life collapse, it did little to mend the broken pieces of my own heart. I knew I couldn't keep living in the past, fueled by anger and vengeance. I needed to move forward for the sake of my children and my own sanity. One afternoon, as I was picking up the kids from school, my phone buzzed with an incoming call from Emily. It had been weeks since our last real conversation and I felt a mix of dread and resolve as I answered. David, she said, her voice shaky. Can we talk, please? I hesitated but agreed. Okay, where? At the park near our old house. The kids can play while we talk. A couple of hours later, I found myself at the park, watching Nathan and Lily on the swings, their laughter a bittersweet reminder of what we once had. Emily arrived shortly after, looking tired and frail. She sat down next to me on the bench and for a moment, neither of us spoke. David, I'm sorry, she began, her voice barely above a whisper. I've been doing a lot of thinking, and I realize how much I've hurt you and the kids. I don't expect forgiveness, but I need you to know that I'm truly sorry. I looked at her, the woman I once loved so deeply. Emily, sorry doesn't change what happened. You broke our family. She nodded tears streaming down her face. I know, and I regret it every day. But I want to try and make things right, as much as I can. I want to be there for Nathan and Lily. They need both of us. I sighed, the weight of her words heavy on my shoulders. What do you suggest, Emily? What do you want? I want to go to counseling, both individually and together. I know it won't be easy but I want to try to repair the damage I've done. The idea of counseling wasn't new to me. I had considered it, but my anger had always gotten in the way. Now, seeing Emily's genuine remorse, I felt a flicker of hope. Maybe, just maybe, there was a way to find some semblance of peace. Okay, I said slowly. We can try counseling, but this doesn't mean I'm forgiving you, Emily. It just means I'm willing to try for the kids. She nodded again a glimmer of relief in her eyes. Thank you, David. I promise, I'll do whatever it takes. As we sat there, watching our children play, I realized that this was the first step toward healing. 
It wouldn't be easy, and the road ahead was uncertain, but at least we were taking a step in the right direction. Over the next few weeks, we started counseling. It was painful and exhausting, bringing up old wounds and forcing us to confront the raw reality of our situation. Emily attended individual sessions to work on her issues, while we both participated in joint sessions to address our fractured relationship. The therapist, Dr. Reynolds, was a calm and patient woman who guided us through the turbulent waters of our emotions. One day, after a particularly intense session, Emily and I sat in the car, the silence between us heavy. David, she said quietly, I've been thinking a lot about what you've been through. I can't imagine the pain I've caused you, but I want you to know that I'm committed to changing. I don't want to lose our family. I looked at her, the sincerity in her eyes striking a chord in me. Emily, it's going to take time. Trust isn't something that can be rebuilt overnight. But I'm willing to try, for the sake of the kids and for our own sanity. The counseling sessions continued, and slowly, we began to communicate more openly. We started to find ways to co-parent effectively, putting Nathan and Lily's needs above our own issues. The tension at home eased a bit, and we even managed to have a few moments of genuine laughter and connection. One evening, as I was tucking Lily into bed, she looked up at me with her big, innocent eyes. Daddy, are you and Mommy going to be okay? I smiled, brushing a strand of hair from her face. We're working on it, sweetheart. Things are getting better, one day at a time. The path to reconciliation was long and fraught with challenges. There were days when I felt like giving up, when the pain and anger seemed too overwhelming. But then I would see the smiles on Nathan and Lily's faces and I knew I had to keep trying. Emily and I eventually reached a point where we could talk without hostility, where we could remember the good times and learn from the bad. It wasn't a fairy tale ending, but it was a start. We decided to take things slow, focusing on rebuilding trust and co-parenting effectively. The romantic aspect of our relationship would have to wait until we were both ready. As the months passed, we found a new rhythm. It was far from perfect, but it was ours. We celebrated birthdays and holidays together, creating new memories while acknowledging the pain of the past. We were far from being the happy couple we once were, but we were parents committed to giving our children the best life possible. One day, as we sat on the porch watching the sunset, Emily turned to me. David, do you think we can ever be more than just co-parents? I thought about it for a moment, the future still uncertain. I don't know, Emily. But I do know that we're both trying, and that's all we can do right now. She nodded, a small smile on her lips. One day at a time, one day at a time, I agreed. In the end, the journey was about more than just healing from betrayal. It was about finding a way to move forward, to rebuild and redefine our lives. It wasn't easy, and there were no guarantees, but it was a journey worth taking. For Nathan, for Lily, and for us. The months turned into a year and the wounds from Emily's betrayal began to heal, slowly but surely. Our counseling sessions continued, and while trust was still a fragile thing, we were making progress. The kids adjusted to the new normal, their laughter and smiles a constant reminder of why we were working so hard to rebuild our lives. Emily and I had come a long way. While we weren't back to being a loving couple, we had found a way to coexist peacefully and even support each other. Our relationship had transformed into something new, grounded in mutual respect and a shared commitment to our children. We had managed to create a stable, loving environment for Nathan and Lily, and that was something I was proud of. One sunny Saturday morning, I was sitting on the porch, sipping coffee and watching the kids play in the yard. Emily joined me, carrying her own cup of coffee. We sat in companionable silence, enjoying the moment. David, I've been thinking, she said after a while. I know things will never be the same between us, but I'm grateful for how far we've come. I appreciate you giving me a second chance to be part of the kids' lives. I nodded, acknowledging her words. It's been a tough journey, Emily, but we've managed to find a way to make it work. For the kids, and for ourselves. She smiled softly. I'm still working on myself, trying to be a better person. I know I have a long way to go, but I'm committed to it. That's all we can do, I replied. Take it one day at a time and keep moving forward. As the weeks passed, I found myself rediscovering old hobbies and passions, 
I started running again, joining a local group that met every weekend. The physical activity was therapeutic, helping me clear my mind and regain a sense of control over my life. I also reconnected with old friends, rebuilding a support network that had been neglected over the years. One evening, after a particularly invigorating run, I received a message from an old college friend, Rachel. We had lost touch after graduation but had recently reconnected on social media. She suggested meeting up for coffee, and I agreed, curious to see where the conversation would lead. Meeting Rachel was like a breath of fresh air. She was warm, engaging, and had a way of making me laugh that I hadn't experienced in a long time. We talked about everything, our careers, old memories, and the challenges we had faced over the years. It was refreshing to have a conversation that wasn't clouded by the past. As Rachel and I continued to meet, I found myself looking forward to our time together. She was understanding and patient, aware of my situation with Emily and the complexities of my life. There was no pressure, just a genuine connection that felt natural and comforting. One evening, as we were walking through a nearby park, Rachel turned to me with a thoughtful expression. David, I know you're still healing and that things are complicated, but I want you to know that I really enjoy spending time with you. Whatever this is, I'm here for it. Her words touched me deeply. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate your understanding. I'm still figuring things out, but I enjoy our time together, too. As our relationship slowly developed, I felt a sense of hope and excitement that had been absent for so long. Rachel brought a new energy into my life, and I began to see a future where happiness was possible again. Meanwhile, Emily and I continued to navigate our new dynamic. We found a rhythm that worked for us, co-parenting with ease and even finding moments of genuine friendship. We celebrated milestones together, from birthdays to Nathan's soccer games and Lily's school plays. It wasn't always easy, but we were committed to making it work for the sake of our children. One evening, as we were preparing dinner, Emily looked at me thoughtfully. David, I've been thinking about our journey over the past year. We've come so far, and I'm grateful for the stability we've found. But I also realize that you deserve to be happy. Truly happy. I paused, considering her words. What are you saying, Emily? I'm saying that if you find someone who makes you happy, you should pursue that. You've given so much to this family, and you deserve a chance at happiness too. Her words were a revelation. Emily was right. I had spent so long focused on rebuilding and healing that I hadn't allowed myself to fully embrace the possibility of a new beginning. Rachel was that possibility, a chance to find happiness and love again. As the months went by, Rachel and I grew closer. We took things slow, mindful of the kids and the delicate balance of my life. But the connection we shared was undeniable, and eventually we introduced her to Nathan and Lily. They took to her immediately, charmed by her warmth and kindness. Emily watched our relationship with a mix of emotions. There were moments of sadness, but also acceptance and even happiness for me. She had found her own path to healing, focusing on her art and building a support network of friends and family. We had managed to forge a new kind of family, one built on respect and love, even if it was no longer the traditional sense of a married couple. One evening as I sat on the porch with Rachel, watching the kids play in the yard, I felt a sense of contentment that I hadn't felt in years. The journey had been long and painful, but it had led me to a place of peace and possibility. Rachel, I'm so grateful to have you in my life, I said, taking her hand. And I'm grateful to have you in mine, David, she replied, her eyes shining with warmth. As the sun set, casting a golden glow over the yard, I knew that this was a new beginning, a chance to build a life filled with love, laughter, and hope. It wasn't the life I had originally envisioned, but it was a life worth living. Emily and I would always share a bond through our children, and we had found a way to coexist and support each other. Rachel had brought a new joy into my life, and I was excited to see where our journey would lead. The past would always be a part of me, but it no longer defined me. I had discovered that even in the face of betrayal and heartache, it was possible to find strength, to heal, and to create a new beginning. And that was a lesson I would carry with me, wherever the future might take me.